the length of the lead-in time. Uh, and that, that could have uh, very unfortunate consequences for those who rely on the contract. And so I, I, I would hope there are no councillors uh, here this evening who are minded not to support uh, what is before them because the consequences, the consequences could be very, very concerning over a period of many weeks for the people, the people who rely on these services, who are amongst the most vulnerable in our community. And I would just make a final point, which I thought was very interesting. It tells us something about the way the party opposite approaches these things compared to ourselves. Uh, there are four parts to this question. I would suggest there should actually be a fifth. Um, the fourth part of the question asks if all providers who may lose clients, well, I would suggest the fifth part should be the other way around. What about the clients who might lose providers? I think our concern on this side of the chamber is much more about the clients and not so much for the providers. So Councillor Critchard. Uh, supplementary to the Deputy Leader. Uh, first of all, thank the Deputy Leader for his answer. And I would also add that obviously our concern is also with the clients. But what I would like to say is this, is that I thank the, leader for your, uh, the Deputy Leader for your answer, but it doesn't go far enough. The ward of the home care contract is one of the biggest decisions this council will face in four years. It is both financially important, as the contract value is around £100 million, and it's also important because it affects the lives of many vulnerable people. It is right and proper that this decision is made by all members of the council, and that is why Labour have referred this up. Paying London living wage should be included in the contract as we Councilor know that Critchard. paying the living wage encourages Critchard, recruitment, this, retention this is a and stability. I'm get getting point? there, Mr Mayor, all of which are vital for the home care. Some fantastic ho local home care providers, including some who offer Councilor specialist Critchard, support. You're making a speech. This is a question. Mr Mayor, I would suggest we do have a lot of people in the gallery and hopefully you can bear with me for... Two seconds. Thank you. Right. Thank you. The OSC's deputation and tonight's numbers in the public gallery show the strength of feeling for Mushkal Hassan and how anxious vulnerable residents, uh, vulnerable individuals are about the future of their care. Will the, lead, will the lead of the deputy leader agree to meet me and the opposition leader to talk about support for clients and providers as covered in my question and his extra addendum? And can we arrange to do this before the Christmas break so we can keep the momentum going as you, so, as you are very concerned about making sure the contract works? I thank, uh, thank Councillor Critchard for her supplementary speech, I think it was, uh, really. Um, yes, I'm d delighted to meet any time and uh, explain the very, very thorough uh, procedure that we've been through. It is enormously important, as I've already said, which is why uh, it has come to uh, the relevant OSC five times, I think, in the last year. First came in September 2017, when the paper was supported unanimously. Uh, then I believe you abstained on the three subsequent occasions. Uh, and it's only very recently that you've somewhat changed your position, which is disappointing but not unusual. Uh, in addition to those five occasions in which the relevant papers came to the OSC, which is unusual, uh, but it does reflect the importance of the contract, uh, there was also a very thorough briefing, a series of briefing sessions, uh, four, I believe, um, arranged for organizations interested in bidding, uh, and they were very well attended. Uh, sadly, some... Some organizations did fall, uh, at, uh, fall away at the first stage of the tendering process. That's the nature of tendering processes. Uh, and several, 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 several organizations, I believe four, actually f fell away at that point. Uh, so there's no, there's no question that any one organization was in any way uh, singled out. It was a properly conducted tendering process done incredibly thoroughly, as I've just described. Point of personal explanation, please. The councillor has mentioned me and the OSC in terms of our voting. Yes, I think I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I don't think I did. I don't believe I did, Mr. Mayor. I, I don't recall that. Um, did, you replied. Councillor Lewitt. 
Mayor, um, I know that the Deputy Leader has kindly added some detail in terms of the, uh, the, sort of the, the, the support um, during the retender exercise during this. Could he give us a bit more detail um, to actually show that we understand what support and information opportunities were given um, to all bidders for, these, uh, for this retendering exercise throughout the procurement process and equally what advice and support was given during the procurement itself? <laughs> I, I, I thank, uh, thank Councillor Lewis for the supplementary question. As, as I've already alluded to, uh, very thorough. I believe there were four sessions uh, which were as, as long as any of the uh, organisations interested in tendering uh, wanted them to be, uh, given all support there possibly could have been in terms of understanding the process itself, because it is laid down uh, in law, EU law, um, how these things are done. Of course, we do an awful lot of it at the Council. All of our large contracts have to go through this process by law. It can be difficult to understand, uh, so we do everything we can to, uh, to help with that. So, as I said, there were four separate briefing sessions in addition uh, to all of those, uh, those uh, occasions when the papers came to the OSC. And I just remembered, I think, there was uh, also a session specifically for members to brief them on the sequencing of events so that they could be absolutely clear what happened and that could be communicated to any organisation uh, interested, interested in bidding for the contract. Uh, question five to the Deputy Leader. Questions of the Leader time four have now elapsed. So we turn to report number one, items for decision. I move reception of that report and will ask the Council whether they approve the recommendations in each paragraph. Paragraph one, is the recommendation approved? I beg your pardon. The Whips have agreed that item 21, the motion on living wage in Wandsworth, will be taken next. Can I ask Councillor Rigby to move and Councillor Wintle to second the motion in their names? Yeah, move the motion the for the living wage. Seconded. There is uh, an amendment to this motion that has been circulated. Can I ask Councillor Bryn to move and Councillor Peter Graham to second the amendment? I move the amendment. Seconded, Mr. Mayor. We've got speakers. Councillor Rigby. Yeah. In the 21st century, poverty is one of the most troubling issues in our society, which is why I believe it is important that we all, re all unite to ensure that people can earn a wage that enables a decent quality of life. It is absolutely right that local authorities in London and elsewhere lead by example by signing up to be accredited living wage employers. Local authorities are setting an example to businesses in their areas where many could afford to follow suit. And those are not my words, those are the words of Kevin Hollingrake, Conservative MP and Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Poverty. A life on low pay often means working longer, working hours, limiting community and family life. Being paid the living wage can mean the difference between just about and earning enough to afford the things that most people agree are needed to live, such as a decent meal, a warm home, a birthday treat for your children. With inflation set to rise and real wage growth, stagnating, the need for a wage that meets the cost of living has never been more important. As shapers of society, local authorities have a key role to play in actively supporting the living wage movement in London. We cannot continue to abrogate the poverty of people who in the end go out each day to work on the council's behalf, even if that work has been contracted out. We've all signed up for the Social Mobility Pledge, but that's just not achievable when you're too exhausted with the stress that poverty inflicts. We have a duty of care to ensure that we are creating social mobility for all, and research from a London authority that has become living wage accredited shows that the largest group of beneficiaries are black, Asian and minority ethnic women aged 41 to 59. 
Um, I don't know how closely you read, Councillor Cook, I don't know how closely you read the Cardiff report, but what it does say is that 70% of the businesses absorb the costs without making significant changes. And I'd love to know if you've spoken to all of the authorities, because the case-by-case case is linked in 98% of cases. The motion we put before the Council was action-orientated, transparent and measurable. There's been lots of lines put through that motion and it's come back looking a little bit woolly and a little bit ambiguous. So I want to be clear what support means. When I say I'll support something, I put my full weight behind making it happen and I hope that's what you mean by supporting it. To support our contractors to become living wage employers, we'll need a roadmap. We'll need milestones and an end date. Support equals a proper plan, not wooliness. And we're ready and eager to work with you to create that roadmap. Let's get cracking on it in the new year and put a date in our diaries when we'll fly the living wage flag over this building. It's too late to pioneer in this space, but as more local authorities become accredited, we're in danger of being last of the party. And Mr Mayor, I want to end by putting on record our huge appreciation to our colleagues in Royal Kensington and Chelsea, who delivered on their support pledge to become the latest London authority to become accredited living wage employers. Thank you from everyone here in Wandsworth. Councillor Peter Graham. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, first of all, I should say that we are understanding of the issues around pay and we are sensitive to that. That's why we pay the London living wage ourselves as a council. It's why we encourage businesses to do so and we are encouraging contractors to do so. But how we move to for forward to do that is not an easy question. And I was a bit surprised sitting there listening to Councillor Rigby because a fortnight ago, her colleague, Councillor Gibbons, uh, brought a paper to the fi Finance and Corporate Resources Committee arguing for accreditation now, but no compulsion about awarding London Living Wage, no insistence that people did so. In fact, he said he wanted bids with and without leaving the council to choose. Tonight, Councillor Rigby's motion says that we should have no choice about it, that it should be automatic when we retender that London Living Wage is there. Those two things are not the same. A fortnight ago, Councillor Gibbons was arguing that pragmatically, your party on that side should break your local manifesto pledge and back something that was evidence-based and gave a way out if it was not practicable. Today, belatedly, Councillor Rigby is reinstating it. The trouble is that Councillor Gibbons has also referred up his own paper. So, a fortnight ago, we had a U-turn on your manifesto. Now we've got another U-turn to reinstate it, and then later this evening, in this same meeting, you'll U-turn again to back Councillor Gibbons' motion and paper, arguing that we shouldn't be doing this at all. And unfortunately, that is the kind of consistent, clear, and unequivocal behaviour that does give Councillor Rigby's piety a certain piquance. But um, let's not be unfair, because it's uh, uh, can neither Councillor Gibbons nor Can I come back Councillor on that? You just mentioned Rigby's me. Up, point in way. person, person, point of whatever that is. <laughs> right, seeing as, you, seeing as you mentioned me, you can carry on with this technical back and forward. There's just one thing. You've become an accredited living wage employer. That's it. Yes or no? Uh, the thing is, becoming an accredited living, living wage employer. Uh, hang on, Councillor okay. Peter Graham. Um, Councillor Ruby, that, that wasn't uh, a point of personal explanation. <laughs> Councillor Peter Graham. I, I, I'm always happy to give way to members of the opposition they wish to make points. Um, the, the trouble is, becoming accredited doesn't mean you actually pay it. Um, we had this argument out at FCROSS. You have to have a plan. But it wasn't clear what your plan was. It wasn't clear what the milestones are. It certainly does not mean automatic on retendering. 
which is what you put down tonight, and nor do you have to be accredited to do that. We're not accredited now, but we're paying the London living wage to all of our employers. You don't need to be accredited to pay it if, if you uh, have contractors. And the reality is that no borough, contrary to Councillor Hogg's point, no borough in London appears to be paying the London living wage to everybody. Islington, which you've hailed as an example, started their policy back in 2012. It's taken them six years. So your chance of sort of a fair day's work for a fair day's pay for a hard day's work, when is that day? In 2024? In 2030? Or immediately as we retender, which is what you're saying now. There is no consistency there. And I would also remind you that it is not a straightforward issue. On Monday night, I was at Mashgal Hassan to listen to the arguments that are being put there and hear what their staff and their patients and, and, and people being cared for were saying. And it was very clear that they were caring for their staff, that there was um, a, a consistency there, that they had this tension. And Mushka Hassan pays the national minimum wage, not a London living wage. So all of the points you're saying, trying to hold up employers or those that don't pay it as somehow bad or callous, are simply not true. And you know that's not true because you see people in the gallery whom you recognize as well who don't pay. The, the reality is that there is a cost. There is a cost. Not always, but often. And Councillor Gibbons went some way to acknowledging that. And you tonight, in this motion, are not. He plucked a figure of £5 million practically out of thin air and then dismissed it somewhat airily as well. But he was prepared to say there was cost. He also had a way of managing it, which is that you didn't necessarily have to pay it. That would have still caused problems, and his paper was full of problems, but it was a more honest approach than the one you are putting forward this evening, which you can only put forward because you know you wouldn't actually have to deal with the consequences of it. If something costs more, that money has to be found elsewhere. That is either a reduction in the quality of those services or it's a reduction in other services. Unless you can identify that money, you can't honestly stand there tonight and say that this is the way forward. Good intentions are not enough. You also need to have a coherent position. And frankly, between yourselves, you haven't even got a coherent position within this meeting. Okay. Councillor Rigby, I, I apologize. Um, you, you, you stood up and you uh, caught the mayor's eye and Councillor Peter Graham gave way. So, perfectly okay. Um, I think at this point, um, we just say, no pressure, but anybody who wants to, to leave the chamber because you've been here long enough or whatever, um, you're, you're, we'll pause uh, to allow you to do that. So now, now's your opportunity um, to, to leave if you want to. Okay, it's obviously riveting stuff. <laughs> Councillor Wintel, maiden speech. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for allowing me to make my maiden speech in this debate on the London living wage. It is an honour to be standing here as the first Labour councillor in St Mary's Park for 28 years. It is also a privilege to be speaking in Wandsworth Town Hall, as this is where my official life started. Nearly 38 years ago, my father registered my birth in this very building. I spent my early years living in Schubert Road in East Putney. After a brief South East London interlude, I returned here 16 years ago, so having lived here half my life, I can truly call Wandsworth home. St Mary's Park is also special to me, as for many years my granny lived in Vicarage Crescent. I have fond memories of Sunday lunch in Battersea Square and walks along the Thames. The Riverside location is one of the key things that gives St Mary's Park its character, including its beautiful views. Canvassing sessions always need a photo break at the top of the tour blocks. The, the historic St Mary's Church, Battersea Square, the amazing shops in Battersea Park Road are joined by many outstanding charities, including KLS, Carneys 
and Keys House, all of which do so much to support residents and create a strong local community. Without these organisations, the community would be a much poorer place. Historically, Battersea is named after an original settlement next to, Batter next to St Mary's Church. While St Mary's Park was home to some early manor houses, it was mostly underdeveloped until the 19th century when industrialisation, including the local flour mills and candle factory, led to development of the area. However, many people were living in slum-like conditions with high levels of poverty, interspersed with areas of prosperity and double-fronted Victorian villas. In 1882, Booth's poverty report described the area as mixed. 120 years later, the area is still mixed, and this makes it a great place to represent. Growing up in inner London diverse communities have been part and parcel of my life, but this has also driven my strong-rooted labour values. I am lucky to have grown up with so much privilege, but I also saw that there were many who were not so lucky and didn't have the same opportunities. My mother remembers me asking as a five-year-old, why didn't we share all our money because that would be fairer? While my views have developed somewhat, my principles remain the same. I want a fairer and more equal society. These values, alongside watching the local community becoming more and more divided by disastrous conservative austerity policies, are what drove me to stand as a candidate. During the election campaign, I met one family who re reinforced my decision to keep fighting for a Labour victory. An elderly, disabled grandmother, two parents and three teenage children living in a one-bedroom flat. The walls were black with mould and three teenage children were sleeping alongside their parents on mattresses on the living room floor. To get home, they had to walk past luxury riverside flats built for millionaires and property developers but not the local community. And the most astounding thing was that two members of this family were working, but working for a minimum wage. To me, this family represents why the campaign for a London living wage is so important. It is not enough for Wandsworth Council to pay its own directly employed staff the wage. It now needs to set an example and pay it to all staff working for them in any capacity. Recently, we all voted in favour of the Social Mobility Pledge. While we recognise that there are many actions to be taken as part of this, Wandsworth Council must lead by example. Not only does paying the London living wage impact some of the most vulnerable in our society, allowing them greater financial independence and a wider range of life choices, it also makes business sense. Taking action does not need to be complex and it doesn't need to be achieved overnight. We are merely asking for a small step change and for the wage to be built into new or re-tendered contracts. A small change for the council, but one that could have a huge impact on so many lives. It is an aspiration, but one that we can make happen if we are really committed. It's easy to find nitpicking reasons against this, but the fact that so many councils are now adopting it means it can easily become a reality. When discussing London Living Wage at Committee, Conservative members spoke about making work pay. But I am saying tonight, make work at Wandsworth Council pay and make it pay a London Living Wage. Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Wintle, for a very powerful speech. Maiden speech. No, uh, another maiden speech. Mis Mr. Mayor, point of order. Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Understanding Order 28A, I move that the council meeting do now adjourn for 19 seconds to consider the number 19 bus. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed that one. Uh, sorry, have you got a second? Uh, uh, I'll second Councilor, this, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Is Councillor Morgan seconding me? Councillor Hampton. Uh, who, who's your seconder? Councillor Morgan. Councillor Morgan. Morgan. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Thank you. I was elected to be a champion for my residents. Tonight, I am the voice for all those people who use the number 19 bus. St Mary's Park 
has the overclouded Clapham Junction nearby, but no tube, so our residents rely on their buses. It is a vital part of our daily lives, commuting to work, taking our kids to school, and our elderly residents need buses to help them live independent lives. Quite simply, it's how most of us get round this great city. The number 19 has run to Battersea for over 100 years, so it is long established and we know well used. Councillor Morgan and I submitted a petition of 2,260 signatures to TfL. They told us that there's been a decline in usage. You tell that to Lorraine, who tells me that when she's going on her commute at 6 a.m. in the morning, she's standing at that bus stop at Battersea Bridge and there's a queue. You tell her that, TfL. TfL want to remove the whole of the number 19 from Hoban to Battersea. They were also very coy about the way they went about their consultation. It wasn't widely advertised, and the complication of trying to sign online was really, really difficult. Even posters put up on bus stops were ripped down. That certainly wasn't by the local community. TfL, there's real dismay and anger in my community, and you need to listen to us. We don't want any more excuses, we just want our bus. But you know what? There, there is one person who can save the number 19 bus. And yes, that is the Mayor, Sadiq Khan. <laughs> uh, actually, he can, you know. He, he does lead the GLA, and uh, as far as I know, he leads TfL as well. We have an increasingly frustrated user population and a travel system that is not good enough or what Londoners deserve. I call on all of you and the GLA member sitting in this chamber to put political differences aside. Let us all lobby the mayor on behalf of our residents. Let's do this together and save the number 19 bus for all of these people. Councillor Cook, do you, do you wish to respond? Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would I'd very much like to, uh, in another nice uh, piece of symmetry, a 19-second adjournment. Uh, question 19 on the order paper is also about the number 19 bus. Uh, it's just as well we're not talking about 485, isn't it? Um, I, I absolutely agree um, with uh, Councillor Hampton. Um, I'm horrified by what has unfolded uh, around the number 19. I've taken a very close interest. Uh, that very impressive petition of 2,200, that is less than half the number of people who use it every day. That is a very, very well-used bus, and what is more, it is more well-used with every passing week, every passing month, because the population is growing, and the Royal College of Art is growing, and all the students and the staff there use it. Uh, it is really beyond belief that TfL think that they can remove this service. There are so many reasons why it should stay. First off, congestion. We all know it's far better to get people onto public transport and out of private cars. We know it's better for air quality to use buses rather than cars. So why on earth are they even thinking about it? Uh, it really is quite, quite beyond me. Um, I challenged the Deputy Mayor for Transport at a London Council's meeting about a month or so ago. Uh, as she had quite rightly made the point that... Um, that uh, buses, uh, buses have to change, they have to evolve with demand and population change in the city. Uh, lots, of, lots of routes are changing at the moment. So I challenged her over the number 19 uh, and uh, she, she absolutely agreed. We must respond to demand. So I would ask our assembly member, can you please follow that up? Because it seems to me that the logic isn't being followed. This is a very, very well used service that is going to cause huge, huge problems if it is removed. And it just should not be happening. It defies all logic. And I very much thank my colleagues for the, the petition and the opportunity to talk about it uh, in the chamber.
Point of personal explanation, please, Mr. Mayor. I've been named by just both of the last two speakers, if you don't mind. I'm sorry to take up people's time, but the implication from both of the last two speakers is that I've only been responding on the number 19 bus um, as a result of their desperate pleas to me. M Melanie Hampton, you know very well that we've been in consultation and I've given you all the information you needed to ensure that the petition... What's a personal explanation on that one? Can one you, email that even, I sent to you, you asking for Mr. your Mayor, help. Councillor Hampton is unable the, to keep her no, mouth shut no, when no, other people are speaking in, in the chamber. You, my name. I think you better wait, Councillor no, Hampton. No, 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 no. Why don't you wait? I, I sent you I don't one think email. Councillor Hampton. Councillor Hampton. I think you called by the Mayor, Councillor Hampton. Councillor Hampton. I am called by the Mayor. Actually, you know what my email said. My email said. Councillor Hampton. Your own chief whip is about to ask you to be quiet. I think your own chief whip has asked you to do what we all wanted to do, which is ask you to be quiet. Okay, fine. Thank you very much, Councillor Leone Krupe. Well, we're all trying to save. Let's now return to living wage versus London trying to save the bus and you oh, right, know that sorry. very well Councillor there's been a Hampton. number of petitions i've also challenged Councillor Cooper, the look, deputy I think we have mayor of this for one. transport as you have i have look i used to live on Battersea square as you probably know i've used the number 19 bus in fact i have friends who lived at the other end of the route i may be the only person in london who's used it from end to end i've been making strong representations about this already and i do not need to be encouraged by anybody in this chamber to make representations i'm listening to the public and not to you playing games Cut. Councillor Hampton, Councillor Hampton, Councillor Hampton, Councillor Hampton, will you stand up, please? I'd like to ask you, do you want to withdraw your adjournment motion or do you want it to be voted on? Okay, we're now going to return to... Uh, London living wage versus living wage. I'm sorry your maiden speech has been uh, somewhat uh, delayed. Councillor Byrne. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Two. Thank you. Um, I first came to know Wandsworth over 20 years ago when visiting my eldest sister who lived here, there, uh, lived here at the time, first working with the learning disabled women of St. Mary's Home in Roehampton and later on with the rough sleepers in the refuge on Cedars Road. But many years before this, my paternal grandfather worked as a labourer in Britain in the second, during the Second World War and afterwards, sending money home to his family in Ireland. This money was clearly wisely invested in my parents, who went on to give their six children the very best start in life. Later on, I came to live in this great country myself, and my interest in local politics began when I was a junior doctor in North London. I had saved and saved to buy a flat, and such a thing is very possible on an NHS salary. And I joined my local residents association in Kensal Green. I pay tribute to them tonight because all over London there are groups like them who are doing the best for their communities and trying to get the best for the streets in which they live. But unfortunately, most of the time in the face of an intransigent Labour Council. Many years later, when I was appointed a consultant at our local hospital, St George's, I came back to live in Wandsworth and I've now lived on the Shaftesbury estate for nearly 10 years. This was, estate was built as an experiment in social housing, and it had four classes of houses according to where the socialist elite felt that you belonged in life. It also had a ban on pubs, but of course, like most socialist endeavours, it soon ran out of money, and so to this day, we are left with a square that still has two sides. This estate, it, gives our ward its name, and it is my great pride not only to represent the people who live there, but those who live la around Lavender Hill and the north side of Clapham Common. In fact, Mr. Mayor, in the coat of arms above your head there, Shaftesbury Ward is the only ward in the borough directly depicted by the sprig of lavender. It is a ward home to no less than 15 grade two listed structures, and these range from K2 phone boxes to artisan cottages, the art centre and the old parish Battersea boundary markers. These markers are quite significant because our residents say on Queenstown Road, Wits's Lane, the north side of Clapham Common, can see from their front doors how better kept their streets are and how better maintained their green spaces are. 
you forgive me if I've forgotten my place in my speech. I'm sorry. It's been an awful bit hard. Uh, but right. Shaftesbury is also time. home to many EU nationals like myself, and I've joined two excellent colleagues, <laughs> Councillor Cook and Councillor Senior, here on the front benches. I've also, since election, done a lot of casework, and I have nothing but profound respect for the officers here at the town hall who have gone out of their way to help residents. And I have met people who work in great teams, like the youth offending team, one of whom told me that having gone to work in another borough, she returned to her colleagues here in Wandsworth, and she described this as being like a homecoming. We are here to serve. We are here to scrutinize and to support. We are not here to relentlessly criticize. And so far, I have seen councillors sit very silently on committees, only to go home and later, behind the security of a social media screen or iPhone, report scorn on the council, which we are all working hard for. And we are all here to do the best for our residents, not to score points off each other. I will also dispense with the tradition of paying homage to one's predecessor, because events have shown that the public are not interested in centrist or single-issue candidates. When the choice on the day came down to bust-in activists, Corbynists, or the Conservatives, the people chose stability. However, I would ha stability is 40 solid years of Conservative administration in this borough that has made it the hang on. of London. Uh, Councillor Byrne, hang on a second. Uh, this, is, this is a maiden speech, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, the choice came down to that. But however, however, I have no hesitation in paying a tribute to Samantha Heath, who, despite a serious illness, got the most votes for her party in the ward. So, turning to tonight's amendment, if anything, over the years has reinforced my Conservative beliefs it was the last Labour government, when people in public service jobs like mine became weighed down by arbitrary targets. So I know that setting any uncosted, blanket minimum as the motion stands will only serve to create a race to the bottom in terms of pay. Our amendment, however, will allow us to continue on what matters to the taxpayers of Wandsworth. And